the uh, uh, um, uh, this is uh, uh, I think this is a lecture a number of you guys have seen before. Um, I've uh, updated it a little bit, but uh, it'll be a lot of uh, similar information. You know, certainly feel free to stop me with any questions uh, at any time. Um, so talk a little bit about the background of periprostatic infection, the incidents. Um, we'll focus a lot on the diagnosis um, and then a little bit on the uh, treatment. So um, the prevalence of, uh, of PJI uh, is, um, uh, is relatively low for primary hip and knee arthroplasty. Um, studies show under one to a little over 1% for primary hips, one to two for primary knees and between three or six for uh, revision surgery. Now, despite that low prevalence, um, you know, the, it's, an, it's a devastating complication um, when it happens. And so it's really, really important for us to, to pay very close attention to. Um, the other sort of interesting thing about the prevalence of PJI is that over time it hasn't changed. So we've managed to reduce the complications that we've had in arthroplasty um, over the decades uh, for most of the complications, including lysis and dislocation um, how, uh, and mechanical failure. However, the prevalence of PJI has remained essentially the same despite you know, all, all the advances in care. Now, it's unclear why this is, but I think it has to do with two main factors. Um, one, is that, uh, one is that it's incredibly difficult to eradicate when it happens. Um, because of biofilm, and two is that our patients are a little bit riskier than they used to be because the so many more of our patients are obese. Yeah. All right. So the risk factors that we know of um, that seem to bear on the literature are any uh, post-operative surgical site infection on the scanner or hematoma formation or excess bleeding, any kind of wound healing complication. Having a prior total joint replacement is actually identified as a risk factor. It's not clear why that is. Any prior infection related to surgery or adjacent bone. Um, a perioperative non-articular infection. So if they have a, you know, a toe infection or you know, something like that, that's a risk factor. Inflammatory arthritis, um, a history of malignant disease or active malignant disease, diabetes is a clear one. And then we think excess anticoagulation, in particular supertherapeutic INR. And that's likely simply because of there's a larger culture medium for the bacteria growing inside the body if they have a bunch of blood in there. It's unclear whether or not smoking or nicotine is actually a risk factor. Some studies say it is, some studies say it isn't. Um, that being said, since it's a modifiable one, um, a lot of practices choose to modify that. Um, obesity is also a pretty clear risk factor too. Um, and the risks go up with increasing obesity. In terms of prevention, um, there's, uh, there's a pretty good document from the international consensus meeting that goes through all of the different things to talk about prevention. However, the only thing that has any really good robust evidence behind it is antibiotic administration within 60 minutes of the incision. That seems to be the most effective method for preventing periprostatic infection. Um, in terms of what skin prep you use or, you know, um, how long you've antibiotics afterwards or what wound closure, it's, the studies are kind of equivocal. It doesn't mean you shouldn't prep the skin. It's really important that you do prep the skin, but whether or not you use, you know, you use 70% alcohol or chlorhexidine with alcohol or iodine and alcohol, you know, it's this uh, antibiotics are the most effective way to prevent it. We classify infection based on its presentation. Um, in the purple book, there's sort of four classifications, um, acute post-operative infection, late chronic infection, acute hematogenous, and then this sort of, this fourth classification, which is an unexpected positive culture. Um, the acute post-operative infection is the infection where the wound never heals and the joint was, was never doing well, um, and they get an infection. Right, so draining wound, or they've they've had pain in the joint since surgery. The acute hematogenous infection is a previously well functioning joint that presents acutely, and the late chronic infection is anything present, preventing one month after surgery. Now, the treatments for this in the purple book are a little bit, you know, there's debate as terms of whether or not at, after one month you automatically jump to removing the prosthesis, but. You know, the, this is what the AOS book says. So, um, you know, 
and that's sometimes what the the board's tests are on so important that you kind of pay attention to that and we'll talk a little bit more about treatment as well so in terms of presentation etiology, the acute postoperative infection is usually staph or beta hemolytic strep. Usually these symptoms appear very quickly and they kind of get what you'd expect, acute onset of pain, swelling, warmth, and you know, possibly some wound issues. Um, the late chronic infection is more often caused by less virulent organisms, coagulative staph, sometimes rare organisms like P. acnes. It can occur kind of any time really. And the symptoms can be a little bit more subtle. They tend to have kind of, you know, uh, subtly increasing in pain. Um, you know, the pain is not always mechanical. Uh, the, uh, you know, the pain may mimic some muscular pain or pain from uh, aseptic leucinin. But in general, the pain from a chronic infection tends to deteriorate over time. So let's say you see you see a patient who, you know, in clinic has is, you know, a year out from their total joint replacement, they're starting to have some pain. Um, you think it's probably just some bursitis or really psoas tendonitis. If the pain doesn't get better with some relatively conservative treatment, you got to pay attention to it and work it up. It's also, I think, never a wrong thing to at least draw inflammatory markers if someone's having a painful total joint to catch things as quickly as possible. And in terms of the hematogenous seeding, um, there's often some inciting event that patients can identify, either a UTI, some kind of skin infection, and often the joint becomes acutely painful within a few days after the event. And you'll see this definitely from time to time where someone will you know, they'll have a well-functioning joint for a while, and then all of a sudden they'll, they'll, you know, they'll get a staph infection in their, you know, in, in their toe, and then boom, their joint will get infected. So let's talk a little bit about how we define and diagnose an infection. So um, the MSI's criteria from 2013 is the one that's sort of most commonly uh, taught about or tested. And does anyone sort of know anything about that? Anyone give me any sort of uh, just a, a baseline of what it is? There's like major and minor criteria um, into diagnosing. And generally, you have one of the major, um, or I think three out of five of the minor, um, okay. consistent with the you know, periprostatic joint infection. Yeah, and, and what are some of the major criteria? Major criteria, um, two positive uh, synovial cultures um, or a sinus tract are the, the two major criteria. Um, for the minor criteria? Uh, the minor would be like inflammatory markers, other inflammatory markers, um, so like a CRP um, or my blood cell count. Um, there is one uh, positive uh, synovial culture is a, is a minor criteria. Um, synovial um, PMN percentage um, is a minor criteria and then uh, one of the fifth one also has to do with synovial analysis. I think synovial white blood cell count is also a minor criteria. Yeah. And so one of two major criteria or four of six minor criteria. However, you can still have infection if less than four criteria are met. It's not, it's not perfectly sensitive, right? Um, and it has been modified since then, and we'll talk about this. So as you said, sinus tract communicated with the prosthesis two positive cultures or elevated inflammatory markers, elevated uh, snobby white blood cell, PMN. Now this presence of purulence in the infected joint, I think is kind of a silly one. Um, you know, that being said, metallosis can sometimes just look like purulence. Um, and then isolation of microorganism or the greater than five neutrophils per high powered field. So let's sort of talk about those a little bit. Um, in detail later. Now, this definition got an update in 2018 with the international consensus meeting that happened in 2018, and it changed actually fairly significantly. Um, so they, uh, the major criteria stayed the same, a sinus tract for two positive cultures. The minor criteria changed a little bit, and they started to develop a scoring system them instead of a sort of four out of six criteria where they weighted the scores based on 
on their sensitivity. Um, and they had a preoperative diagnosis portion and a postoperative diagnosis portion. So the, uh, with the minor criteria, the most important change was that they, they dropped um, intraoperative histology and they added alpha defensin. They also added D-dimer leukocyte esterase because there are certain places where these tests are more readily and easily available. Um, but the biggest change was alpha defensin, it had a pretty high weight. So if you had a positive alpha defensin, you were automatically possibly infected, all right? Now, the postoperative diagnosis, they, they, the, that included histology, purulence, and a positive single culture, plus your, your preoperative score, all right? So they kind of divided the two. Now, now, what's interesting about this is that the original MSIS criteria, or the insulin sensitive meeting criteria, at best had a sensitivity of about 87%, even though it was highly specific. The new PJI definition had a much higher sensitivity while retaining its specificity. So the newer criteria seems to add some benefit for us. Now, if you go through the AOS clinical practice guidelines in terms of diagnosing a peripressor joint infection, this doesn't yet include the, the new criteria, but they did have some recommendations in terms of uh, sort of strong or moderate support. Um, and this included how to work this up, right? So strong support, ESR and CRP on everyone, aspiration if either of them high. Um, intraoperative gram stain was not a good test. Frozen sections or histology is reasonable to do if you're uncertain. Taking multiple intraoperative cultures and they had strong recommendations for not initiating that antibiotics until after cultures were obtained. However, I think this has a caveat to it. What they mean really is not initiating antibiotics, you know, long before cultures have been tamed. There's now been some studies that have suggested that it's okay to do preoperative antibiotics right before you make a skin incision, and that may actually be preventative of another infection. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to start antibiotics in the emergency room, but it's still okay to give them before you make the skin incision. They had some moderate recommendations and then some inconclusive recommendations um, and a weak recommendation for nuclear imaging. So uh, diagnosis. So in terms of radiographs, um, what, uh, uh, you know, when do we see these kinds of things? When do we see periosteal reactions, osteolysis, uh, bone reabsorption? Do we see it early or late in the diagnosis or disease progression? You see it later in disease progression because that's when it's already osteomyelitis rather than septic arthritis. Exactly, yeah, no, if you're seeing this stuff and the thing's infected, it's been going on for a while. So. How about uh, nuclear studies? So when, do you, when do we see positive nuclear studies? I think you see that earlier than the x-ray findings, but it's still later than like acute septic arthritis. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, the, and it kind of depends on the study. So tag like blood cell studies, you tend to see a little bit earlier. The fluorinated glucose studies, you tend to see a little bit later, but they're both positive earlier. Now, certain studies have actually really high sensitivity and specificity um, uh, for, uh, or something going on at the bone, but it's it's not 100% specific for infection. So they're not the greatest studies, but they can be helpful sometimes. In terms of serologic tests, ESR and CRP remain our best screening tests. They're very, very high sensitivity um, and low cost. Uh, they're also, um, you know, they're also not invasive procedures, right? It's not an aspirate. Um, it's not a surgery or biopsy or anything like that. Um, but it's important to remember when these normalize, right? CRP normal, CRP levels normalize within a few weeks, but ESR can stay high for months. You also have to be careful about other reasons that they're high, right? So in the patient with inflammatory arthritis, for instance, these are not gonna be very good tests. They could be high simply from their inflammatory arthritis. Some other tests have been advocated, including things like IL-6, TNF-alpha, procalcitonin. Um, there was a uh, OIT question of procalcitonin a few years ago, which is kind of, funny. Um, but 
these are not particularly common tests used. Um, IL-6 might be coming sort of down the pike as a more accurate, as a, a more useful test. However, most people are using uh, alpha defense instead if they really have a high suspicion. In terms of the synovial fluid analysis, this is always the tricky one, right? So, you know, um, what's the, uh, what's sort of the, the dichotomy challenge with all of the numbers that we talk about with synovial fluid analysis? You talk about the difference between the acute infection and a chronic infection? So that's part of it, right? But let's say that, you know, so every year there seems to be a study that comes out that lowers the number of white blood cells needed to have a positive infection, right? What's the downside to that? And you're just more and more, <clears throat> you're making a test that's more sensitive potentially. So you're maybe capturing a lot of things that aren't actually truly an infection. Exactly, right. So the more sensitive it is, the less specific it's going to be in general. And we really want a test that has high specificity and sensitivity. So while synovial fluid analysis is a, is a critical component of, uh, of diagnosis of periprosthetic infection, it's certainly not the end all or be all. Um, and you can certainly have cases where there's actually a high white blood cell count, but the, the patient is not infected. Um, what might be that scenario? rare, but it happens after total knee replacement, for instance. You can still have crystalline arthropathy. Exactly, right? So you can have pseudogout in a total knee replacement. The white blood cell count would be super high, but the patient will have nothing on cultures and they'll, their pain will resolve with enzymes. Um, and so there are times when this, this test, when stomach fluid analysis really has, you know, uh, is not the best test. Now, if you add CRP to a synovial fluid analysis, that improves the sensitivity and specificity um, if you're compared to a serum CRP, but not a lot of places will run a synovial CRP. Again, this is kind of where alpha defensin tends to come into play as being a very, very useful test in the sense that it gives us kind of one more criteria that's a little bit just a yes or no. Hey, Jared, uh, this is Sarah. Yeah. I have a question. Do you plan sure. on using procalcitonin? You know, we have not been using procalcitonin. Um, you know, I, I think we've mostly been using alpha defensin as our kind of as our kind of test when we're not sure. Um, now, the, the thing about alpha defensin is that they will they'll run a synovial CRP, and they also do if you want them to, they'll do a uh, They'll now do specific panels looking for biomarkers of specific bacteria. So it sort of becomes a better and better test. Um, what's, the, what's the downside to alpha defensin? Uh, I don't know the specificity. Pretty specific, actually. It takes time and it's expensive. Exactly, right? So it takes a few days and it's, it's expensive. Now there is a there is a lateral flow assay that's now de been developed with alpha, alpha defensin so that you can actually have a point of care test, but it is not as sensitive. So there are a number there have been shown to be a number of false negatives, and so it may be a really good way to rule in an infection, but it is not necessarily a great way to rule out an infection. Hopefully, eventually we'll have a lateral flow assay from alpha defensin that that is much more sensitive, but we don't yet. And it's also very expensive. Here's another test. It's actually pretty simple and available pretty much everywhere because it's from, you can use a urine dipstick. Um, that's a point of care testing. Um, and that's leukocyte esterase. Now we don't use this here, but there are places that use it routinely. Um, and they'll, you know, you can aspirate a knee, uh, put the aspirate on, on, a, on a leukocyte esterase strip and, and see how many leukocytes are in there. Um, anyone imagine sort of what the challenges to this are? So what kind of fluid do you normally get out of a knee? Thick synovial stuff and blood. Yeah, and blood. but you know, if you're poking around in there a bunch, if it's been painful, if it's like not that soon post-op, you get some blood, right, often. Um, and you can't do this test with a bloody aspirin because the blood just messes with the actual color that you're going to get. So in terms of gram stain, this is a crappy test. 
Um, it's incredibly unreliable. It depends who's looking at the thing. Now, if they have a positive gram stain, it's helpful. But they, if they have a negative gram stain, it kind of means nothing. Right. So don't rely on the gram stain. So um, in terms of culture, in ter you know, the, the challenging thing with cultures is that you know, culture is actually a pretty, not, not a great test in terms of its, its sensitivity, right? A lot of cultures don't grow. It's actually difficult to get cultures to grow on certain media. You know, it takes time. But the way to improve the accuracy of culture is you want to take multiple specimens from different affected areas of the knee. How many, how many cultures do you, should we take? An odd number, at least three. <laughs> yeah. How, how many is too many? <laughs> I don't know. So the, the, the international meeting consensus guidelines say that uh, uh, three to five, but no more than five. Um, and the reason for that is, is, is that the, the expert consensus was, is that when you get more than five cultures, you start to get a bunch of, you start to get a bunch of cultures that you don't know what to do with. You get one out of seven being positive for something pretty frequently. But three to five is kind of the recommended number. You want to always hold them for 14 days. Um, some institutions are going to that as a standard, but a lot you, you have to ask for it. Uh, you want to have, and this is again, ID mostly controls a lot of this stuff as well as laboratory medicine, but you want to have the cultures inoculated in a broad spectrum of media. Um, and then you want to uh, you want to use media that facilitates the the growth of, of um, the growth of bacteria that have developed biofilm. Right? So that's uh, semi-solid or, or uh, semi-solid nutrient agar. In terms of histopathology, again, like not a great test. It really depends on who's looking at it. We tend to not use this very often, but if we are really on the fence, um, it's, it may be useful in terms of deciding to re-implant. Right. I don't think you see us do this very often, but, and then the other test that is kind of coming down the pike is molecular diagnostics. So the big advantage to this is that, is that molecular diagnostics are, are completely culture independent. Um, and they're particularly suited for organisms that are less real and indolent, don't grow well in culture media or have adaptive biofilm. There's kind of been a number of different iterations of this. Initially, amplification using PCR. There's sort of a number of different uh, PCR developments, and then there's this recent move towards mass spectroscopy. And this is kind of what uh, what mass spectroscopy uh, looks like when you when you send a culture off. They test for a bunch of these different kind of biomarkers in terms of of detecting the uh, the uh, bacteria. It's very sensitive. It can detect films of biofilm. It can detect genes that control resistance. Um, and it has the ability to identify all bacteria present within a sample in a relatively short period of time. Um, now, what do you guys think of the downsides to this? So the simple ones of cost and availability, right? It's super expensive and not many places are gonna have this readily available. But what's another potential downside? Well, if it's basing it off of like these specific, you know, whatever's in their database, it may or may not include everything, I would imagine. Sure, it could miss some stuff, but the databases are pretty big at this point. But what it's sort of the opposite problem, not that it'll miss things, but it'll kind of catch too much, right? So there may be very normal bacteria that's present that needs to be present in our bodies or that may not be pathologic, or that may have been sort of landed on the sample off the back table, and it'll detect that. And if it detects 15 different types of bacteria, you're really not sure what to do with that, right? So it can kind of over detect instead of under detect. So, um, so for instance, this was a, a study that they looked at where they looked at mass spectroscopy in, in culture negative periprosthetic joint infection. So it was helpful in that. Um, it identified the same pathogen in most of the cases. However, it, uh, it detected more than one organism in a number of the culture negative cases. 
And so it was unclear kind of what to do with that when some of those organisms weren't typical organisms or weren't organisms that really even made sense the infectious disease of folks. So let's talk a little bit about biofilm in terms of its challenges in general. So it's very difficult to diagnose because um, it's hard to detach the bacteria from an implant. Um, it does not form colonies in the agar. Um, and it produces this glycocalyx, which is invisible to our host immune system and highly resistant to any antibiotic therapy. And the way it works is that the, uh, the uh, bacteria that are phenotypically metabolically distinct from planktonic counterparts create this uh, foreign sensing mechanism, and then they grow this biofilm over each other and allows them to reproduce within this biofilm without detection. So, all right, so let's talk about treatment a little bit. So our treatments are medical or surgical. So um, when would we choose medical treatment only? Maybe it's someone who couldn't um, tolerate a procedure or another surgery. So someone's really sick or a lot of comorbidities that could stand another orthoplasty surgery. Absolutely, right. So someone who, um, you know, someone who really just you know, is too sick for surgery or, you know, doesn't want surgery. Um, but uh, what's the, what are, what's the long-term implications of suppressive antibiotics? It's terrible for antibiotic stewardship. Absolutely. Right, so it's poor antibiotic stewardship or theoretically growing resistant bacteria, although not as much as the antibiotics we put in cow feed, but you know. Um, what else? What's the downside for the patient? It's a lot of side effects of antibiotics and chronic monitoring of labs. Totally, right? You know, the vast majority of antibiotics require some kind of monitoring of labs. Most antibiotics have some kind of side effects. Some of them have pretty severe side effects. What else? You're not actually clearing the infection. Exactly, right? So you, they will always be infected and eventually it, it will likely fail, right? Either the bacteria will become resistant to the antibiotic, there will be a different bacteria that will come in and overgrow. The prosthesis will become so loose and unstable that the patient will have a ton of pain and it won't work for them. Um, and they're always kind of sick, right? So for patients who are, who are fighting a chronic infection, you know, you, when you talk to them, they always feel fatigued, right? They, they, it's not, not ideal. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about surgery. Right. So let's talk about irrigation and debridement. So when, when would we choose an irrigation and debridement? In an acute infection where they are likely not infected by biofilm forming organisms yet. Exactly. And how quickly does biofilm form? I think it's like around like the four week mark. Yeah, it's a really good question. So we're not totally sure, but there are some lab studies that show that biofilm can start to form in as little as 72 hours after an infection. Now, it may take longer in a lot of people, um, but what that means to me is that if you know you have an acute infection, you know, you don't necessarily need to do the irrigation debridement like that night unless they're septic, but you should probably do it pretty quickly, right? Because you're probably giving them the best chance of not forming biofilm and the best chance of eradication or at least su successful treatment. You know? Um, who else would you consider an IND on? Let's say, let's say they, they've been infected, you think they've been infected for three months or four months or longer, and they have well-fixed implants. Who else would you consider an IND? You also consider doing an IND on patients where, you know, the cost of taking out an implant, especially if they have cone sleeves or other large revision implants, is going to be more problematic. Um, and also patients who have failed multiple two-stage exchanges before. Right, absolutely. So you have to consider the morbidity of the explant, right? Um, there's a study in JBJS by uh, Dr. Barry et al. Um, that shows that for heavily instrumented revision knee replacements in a short time frame, two-year period, 
the success of IND and chronic suppression was about the same as the success of a two-stage. However, the functional outcomes were actually worse for the two-stage. So you really have to consider the, the morbidity if you have someone who is extensively instrumented um, and, the, and the morbidity of the surgery of that for them. Who else might you consider an IND um, on? Somebody who is uh, being overwhelmed by their bacterial burden. You, yeah, could, you could decompress them. Right, yeah. So someone who has well-fixed implants, who's septic, um, but you know they're pretty sick for an explant or they really don't want an explant or they, you don't think they're gonna tolerate an explant. You know, because the, uh, there's some literature that suggests that explanting, you can have a liter, liter and a half, sometimes more blood loss, right? So someone who's septic with a bunch of pus in their knee, it's a very reasonable thing to go wash out their knee, decrease the bacterial burden, get them through their sepsis, and come back later and talk about what they kind of want to do next. So, so how well does this work? Well, it works okay for a certain patient population. Now, the literature is kind of all over the map in terms of how this fails, and it depends on so many different factors that it's really, really hard to, to sort of have a formulaic approach to this. Um, the, the failure rate is higher with the things that you'd expect, right? So the longer the infection has been in there, the sicker the patient, the more virulent the bacteria, um, all of those things contribute to the failure rate of an IND, even though it's a much less morbid procedure. Then that begs the question, of whether or not it's actually a less morbid alternative. Now, this is a study that receives, that is actually pretty controversial in terms of the outcomes that people take from this. So there are a number of surgeons who believe that uh, there is a potentially adverse effect of a subsequent, uh, of doing an IND on the patient's long-term outcome if they required a two-stage exchange label. All right. So this study showed that the uh, patients who were initially had an IND had a 66% chance of infection control following two stage versus historical two stage controls of 80 to 90%. Now, all of the studies that have looked at this really don't account very well for, for those patient factors. All right. So the patients who are going to fail an IND are going to be the sicker. Um, the sicker ones, the more virulent organisms, they're also going to be the ones who are going to be more likely to fail a two-stage versus historical controls. And these studies, in my mind, really don't control well for that. The other, things, the other thing that these studies don't control for is patient choice, right? And what I mean by that is that if, you know, if you were a patient and you were given the option of a 40% chance of success of an IND, even if you knew that your chances of having a two stage, your chances of having a successful two stage exchange down the road were later, if you failed that IND, would you make that choice? And that's a very individualized decision. Decision, and I'm not sure that's a decision that we, you know, we can really make for our patients. I think it's a decision that has to be shared. You know, and I'd say that for myself. Like, let's say I was. You know, I thought I had a 50% chance of success of an IND, even if I thought I had a 10 or 15% chance, less chance success of a two stage down the road if I failed the IND, I'd probably still take that 50% chance of an IND to have a 50% chance of avoiding the two stage. Right. That study, are they suggesting that the actual IND itself makes it harder for them to clear an infection for two stage, or they just think that that's like a, like a, uh, like a marker, somebody who's in fail. Yeah, so a lot of people think that it's a proxy for the for the host, right? The host and the organism and everything else, right? Some people think it's the fact that if you if you went in and did an IND and didn't work, you are not clearing the bacteria. You're allowing the bacteria more time to integrate into the bone, creating more osteomyelitis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore make it, you know, by not doing the two stage right away you are making the two stage less successful. But I, I personally think this remains a, a, a real debate in our profession. And also too, the other thing is one IND and another IND are not the same, right? You know, so someone who goes in and just kind of like 
washes out the joint with some saline versus someone who goes in and does a really thorough synovectomy, you know, cleans out the joint as much as possible, does saline, betadine, dilute hydrogen peroxide, puts in stimulant bees, does a double anim, you know, irrigation debridement where they debride one day and then the next week they come back and do a second debridement, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do an IND. And so I think it also depends on the practice patterns. And these studies really don't have great accounting for those practice patterns. I see. So talking a little bit about one stage exchange arthroplasty, um, the, um, this was originally described a long time ago. The idea is, is that it has reduced morbidity, um, improved function and overall lower healthcare cost. Um, the, it's, it's got a lot of popularity in Europe. However, in Europe, they do it very differently than we have historically done it here. And the vast majority of this success comes from this one clinic in Germany called the Endo Clinic. Now, if you go to the Endo Clinic and you actually watch what they do, it's pretty radical um, in terms of the debridement that they do. So what they do is they have two separate teams. They have a debridement team and they have a reconstruction team. The patient goes into one OR and they get the explant and debridement. And when I say debridement, I mean like, you know, it's like a can't, it's like a tumor case where they are really debriding, you know, an extensive amount, you know, debriding everything they can from the synovium, debriding a ton of bone, resecting a ton. Then the patient is washed out, cleaned up, closed. Then they go into a separate clean OR and reconstructed by a separate team. So that's different than sort of what we've done historically. Now, there is a lot of renewed interest in this, and there are some studies that are going on comparing this now in the United States with a much more strict criteria. The other thing that, that the endo clinic does and all the places that have success with this, they really do have a strict criteria. So it has to be a grade A patient with a known sensitive organism um, and good bone stock uh, in order for this to be successful. So the two-stage exchange really has been the gold standard in the United States. The success ranges depending on the study you read, but if it's a well-done two-stage exchange, you know, in a good host with a less virulent organism, the success rates can approach 90%, but it's highly morbid and very costly to the healthcare system. This is what we do mostly here, although we are doing some one stages now, um, but this is what you guys mostly see. And then that begs the question, kind of when to reimplant, right? So, um, you know, reimplantation is not a is not a strict formula. It really needs to be based on clinical exam, improvement serologic markers, uh, patient condition, wound. But in general, most patients will get four to six weeks of IV antibiotics, have some kind of holiday, be retested, and then have the reimplantation. Now, there are some studies that suggest the longer the reimplantation is delayed, the lower the success rate. But again, the, I think those studies are really talking about the patients who are very bad candidates for reimplantation in general. Um, so, you know, the patients who have delayed reimplantation, they may their implant may get reinfected. There may be the sicker, more morbid patients, the more obese patients, the patients who you're having to do a second IND on. But the key is, is that you don't want to do the reimplantation too soon. It's pretty clear that that's not a good idea. So you don't take them to the OR, explain, keep them in, the ho in hospital for two weeks, and then put it back in. You really want to wait until the IV antibiotics have had time to, or actually oral. Now there's some suggestion oral is just as effective as IV, but until the antibiotics have had time to cure the treat the infection. So talking about spacers. Um, Goal of the spacer is to reduce dead space, provide some clean joint stability, deliver a local dose of antibiotics, and also keep the patient more comfortable. But the downside is there is some systemic toxicity. You may have some resistant organisms and spacers, once they finish their elution, can actually form biofilm on their own. So, um, what, are, uh, what are the advantages? What's the difference between static and articulated spacers? So static spacers may be more like soft tissue friendly if you have a really poor soft tissue envelope, but they're um, like less functional for the patient. Um, they also, I think there's at least a theoretical chance that they don't affect bone stock as much as the articulating spacers do. Yeah, that's a, I think that's more theoretical than anything else. I think it depends on how you construct your spacer. Um, 
but this, what's the, uh, so the static spacers are definitely more soft tissue friendly um, and they're a little bit more robust for a patient and they can last longer. Um, you know, articulating spacers will sort of, will fail over time, depending no matter what you do. What's the downside to static spacers? I mean, I think it's pretty difficult for a patient because it's essentially a joint fusion for the time that it's in there. Yeah, patients hate them. Um, you know, in particular, they hate them for hips and they hate them for knees. Um, and then in general, the other downside is that this, the subsequent surgery is harder, right? So if you go back, going back in, taking out a static space or it's a bigger pain in the ass, there's more joint contractures in the hip, the hip is kind of shortened. It's harder to get your length back. For the knees, it's harder to get your motion again. And the outcomes show that for articulating spacers, particularly for knees, the outcomes in terms of motion tend to be better um, for knees. But the important thing is you should use the spacer that the patient necessitates in terms of what I call the hierarchy of needs. So the first thing is you have to get them to clear their infection and you have to get their wound to heal, right? So if you think you're gonna have a hard time doing that with an articulating spacer, then you should put in a static spacer. The other beef I have with articulating spacers is the spacers that are made like this, the one on the screen here. If you just put a hockey puck in between here, I've seen this happen three times now, this hockey puck can spit out the front and erode through the patellar tendon. So don't do this. All right, so we kind of talked about a little bit about this. The static spacers are also cheaper in general is the other thing. So in terms of antibiotics, it's really important sort of what antibiotic choice you have. And there's a number of papers that kind of help us with this. Um, in general, the, um, you, um, you wanna have at least uh, sort of four packages of antibiotics of some type, four grams of antibiotics of some type, but not more than eight grams of antibiotics of some type in the cement. Um, in order for it to work, you need to choose a heat-stable antibiotic. Um, and often you, you want to choose a synergistic combo, some kind of amino glycoside and vancomycin in general. Now, you know, antibiotics that you choose in cement will depend on the organism if you have a known organism. So for instance, for a fungal infection, you want to add some kind of antifungal. This gets a little bit tricky because there aren't a lot of heat-stable antifungals and hospitals don't always carry them. Uh, what's a girdle stone? That's your question. Yeah, so is it essentially just, you just do like a neck cut. Uh, it's a salvage procedure. Uh, you do a neck cut and then leave it, leave it like that. Like what right. you see on that x-ray. Yeah, the resection arthroplasty is sort of a last stitch procedure to try to clear an infection. It's just a joint resection. Um, what, uh, um, how do these patients do? The people who do them always claim that they're very functional, but I don't believe it. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting question. So now having done a number of these for certain patients, it's a pretty wide range. So I have a patient, I can show you guys a video, I didn't put it in the talk, but I can show you guys a video of a patient who has a resection, who walks very quickly and with no pain with a walker, he's actually able to walk without a walker with a fairly big limb. Um, and he is, he loves his resection because he had like 50 hip surgeries and he is now infection free, doesn't have to have any more surgery. And he's like done with that part of his life, hopefully. On the other end of the spectrum, I have a patient who I, who I resected because she was elderly and incredibly sick and had multiple revision procedures and was you know, a terrible candidate and had a chronically dislocated revision hip. Um, and she's in a wheelchair and she hates me. Um, so you know, there's a fairly, fairly wide variety. But I think again, the key is, is the patient understanding what they're getting into. And the, you know, in, in certain cases, they're really, not putting an implant in is really in their best interests. Do we ever do knee resections? And how do they do? Anyone know? I would guess terribly. 
Yeah. So functionally, not so great, right? You know, they, they can't walk on it. Um, you know, sometimes they can kind of piston on it with a knee mobilizer, but they can't really walk on it like they can on a hip. But um, there's a couple small series now that look at knee resections and sort of patient outcomes and find that, you know, a certain percentage of patients, it actually ends up being an okay procedure. Patients who don't have enough bone stock fusion or can't undergo a fusion, um, patients who, you know, have had um, uh, uh, just, you know, terrible times of their knees and patients who are horrible candidates for reimplantation. So every once in a while, you get a candidate, a patient for whom this is their best option, even though it's not a great option. So it is an option for knees as well, but one we, we don't go with lightly. Would you, would you request that instead of like an amputation? Like how do you have that discussion? Yeah, you know, I mean, so the benefit to a resection over an amputation is that the patient gets to keep their leg and many patients, you know, for many patients, that's a really important thing, right? Many patients have a very, very difficult time with the concept of losing a limb and that's totally understandable. The other, the other part of that is that an amputation is actually a pretty morbid procedure. And there's some studies that show that for patients who get above knee amputations after knee infections, their one year mortality is 50%. You know, it's not, an, it's, it's a fairly large surgery to go through, even though it seems relatively simple. Um, and a big recovery for patients to go through. And most patients who get above knee amputation in this patient population can never use a prosthesis anyways. So, but yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an important thing to talk about with the patients. We'll skip over this, just sort of historical about girdle stone, but uh, even Murray described resection arthroplasty back at UCSF and the, you know, back in the, I think, I think uh, Hubert Kim was a resident back then. Um, talking about arthrodesis, so reasonable option for knee patients um, who have enough bone stock. Um, you know, a lot of patients will choose not to have this, but it is a reasonable option for certain patients. So, and then we talked about amputation. Again, an important option for patients with knee replacements um, who have undergone multiple failed, uh, uh, failed attempts at salvage. But there are, it is highly morbid. Um, and, you know, it is, most patients can't use a prosthesis. So some, just in the last minute or two, um, things that are kind of coming down the pike, or I guess, are we, are we out of time? Yes, we're out of time, all right. But briefly, some things are coming down the pike are smart implants, hopefully, that will either reduce biofilm or reduce the formulation of biofilm and eventually hope, uh, help, help get, us, get us to the point where we don't have as much of this problem anymore.